and put his states be the rich and poor of all degree. Timor Mortis conturbat me. He has ta'en rule o' Aberdeen and gentle rule o' Costal Fiend. To our better fellows did no man see. Timor Mortis conturbat me. He is all my brother ta'en. He will not let me live alone. Of force I man his next spray be. Timor Mortis conturbat me. As the world now knows, Richard Burton died yesterday in Geneva. It was a long way from his birthplace in South Wales and a world away in lifestyle from his humble beginnings. Wales had lost one of its most notable artistic sons. The world stage was poorer for his demise and the media is now without one of its most colourful and prolific headline grabbers. Acting, however, is not real life and headlines are a meagre and exaggerated chronicle of existence. To know Richard Burton only for his acting, his romances, his enjoyment of a drink, and a certain penchant for diamonds is also an inadequate summary of the man. We must also consider his beginnings in a tight Welsh society, the encouragement without which his later talent might not have flourished, the strong family ties that he maintained all his life, the warmth of the man for his community, and indeed it for him, and of course his own views on life. Journalist and broadcaster John Morgan now takes up the story. Richard Burton was born in the mining village of Pontry de Ven in South Wales, where the Avon Valley is narrow and dark. He was the twelfth child of the family. His father was a miner. His mother died when he was very young, and he was brought up by his sister. When he was rich and famous, he would talk about the poverty of his youth and the uncertainties created by his swift rise. Even as an adolescent at the Port Albert Secondary School, he had that brooding air that was to characterize the mature actor. He'd been adopted by a teacher at school, Philip Burton, and then changed his surname from Jenkins to Burton. The teacher produced plays for BBC Radio. While at school, the young Burton appeared in an Emlyn Williams play, The Druid's Rest, in the West End of London. He'd answered an advertisement. Emlyn Williams was to be a patron and lifelong friend. He said then that Burton looked like a boxing poet. Richard Burton served in the RAF, went briefly to Oxford, and very swiftly became one of London's leading actors. He began at the top, which was to be one of the problems. At the Royal Shakespeare and at the Old Vic, he became the great hope of the English-speaking stage. His superb physical presence, the Welsh rugby player on stage, his warm yet tough voice, his almost intuitive understanding of the rhythms of Shakespeare's verse, made him a hero to audiences and won the admiration of critics. Of his Prince Hal in Henry IV, Kenneth Tynan wrote, Burton, at 25, is a still, brimming pool, commands repose, and can make silence garrulous. He brings his cathedral on with him, said one dazed member of the company. We can, safely, send him along to swell the thin company of living actors, shown us the mystery and the power of which heroes are capable. But even in the early 50s, when still only 26, he was tempted into the movies. Hollywood called the Golden Boy, and the Golden Boy answered, yes. For his first Hollywood role in My Cousin Rachel, he was nominated for an Oscar. He was to have five more Oscar nominations for Beckett, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and The Rogue. Yes, 32. Did you think it would protect you here? No, sir. Tell me, could you? Do you expect us to believe these stories that this Jesus could heal by the touch of his hand, make the crippled walk, and the blind see again? It makes no difference whether you believe them or not, sire. All that matters is that there's no story that he ever made anyone blind. There's no story that he made anyone a cripple, or ever raised his hand except to heal. Sire, if you'd had the chance I had, to talk with those who knew him, to hear his words, to learn what was in his heart... Stop! You tried to confess me to your treason! I only want to show you your opportunity, sire. If the Empire desires peace and brotherhood among all men, then my king will be on the side of Rome and the Emperor. But if the Empire and the Emperor wish to pursue the course of aggression and slavery that have brought agony and terror and despair to the world, if there's nothing left for men to hope for but chains and hunger, then my king will march forward to right those wrongs. Not tomorrow, sire. Your majesty may not be so fortunate as to witness the establishment of his kingdom, but it will come. 
Burton had married a young girl, an actress from Ferndale in the Ronda Valley, Sybil Williams. He was to leave her for Elizabeth Taylor in what became a romance that intrigued the world. He would try and calculate how many forests had been torn down to provide the newsprint for all the press stories about them. That heroic Shakespearean period when his Iago and Othello, his Hamlet and his Coriolanus had demonstrated to the world that here was a stage actor of genius was behind him. Most of his films were bad. Only in a handful did he find the script and the director to rouse his enthusiasm. One was Beckett. You may return to England. Thank you, my prince. I meant to go back in any case and give myself up to your power. But in all things that concern this earth, I owe you obedience. We've finished now. And I'm cold. I feel cold too. Now. You never loved me, did you, Thomas? In so far as I was capable of love, yes, I did. Did you start to love God? You mule! Answer a simple question! Yes. I started to love the honor of God. I should never have seen you. It hurts too much. My prince. No! No pity. Death. This is the last time I shall come begging to you. Go back to England. Farewell, my prince. I sail tomorrow. I know that I shall never see you again. How dare you say that to me when I've given you my royal word? You take me for a traitor? In the night of the iguana, Richard played a priest, a whiskey drinker, a role in which he could express his own contradictory, self-destructive nature. The self-aware, intelligent, educated Welshman felt at home in the part. Mary was a lady. Last night, she died. Toll the bell for lovely Nell. My dark virginity bride. <laughs> in this room. Don't you step over that threshold. Don't complicate my life. I've got a fever. Don't, don't complicate my fever. Jerry, watch out. You're walking on broken glass. Oh, never mind that. Stand still. You're cutting your feet. You're leaving blood stains on the floor. Who saw you coming here? Nobody but an iguana. Your, your guardian angel will be in full cry. Better howl. I hate her. And I hate that little snitch of a bitch that ruined you in Virginia. Well, you, you're ruining me in Mexico. Now get up of your knees. It's indecent. Now sit down over there. I want to explain something to you. Now look and listen. A man has got just so much in his emotional bank balance, but mine has run out. It's stone dry. I can't draw a check on it now. There's, there's nothing left to draw out. Oh, Lord. You've got blood stains on you. I'm sorry to tell you that you're as dangerous as you're young and lovely. And, and, and it's your being young and lovely that, that makes you so dangerous, that gives you this, this destructive potential over a destructible man. We're not going back. We'll stay here together, live here, be beachcombers, like such a Christian, that native girl, living in the sun. You're going to marry me, Larry. Oh, 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 Lord, no, no. And nothing could be worse for a girl in your unstable condition to be mixed up with a man in, in my unstable condition. Because two people in unstable conditions are like two countries facing each other in unstable conditions. The uh, destructive potential uh, could blow the whole world to bits, uh, past all repair. You're walking barefoot on more glass. I would walk on brimstone through hell uh, to get you out of my room. Now, will you? Will you get out of my room? I don't believe you don't love me. I love, I love, I love, I love nobody. I know it's practically impossible for anybody to realize that they are not loved when they're in love with somebody that they think they're in love with. But nevertheless, you couldn't walk barefoot on glass if you didn't love me. I am walking barefoot on glass because you won't leave me alone. The spy who came in from the cold attracted him, and he gave a fine performance. While he was absent from the London stage, he was busy on stage in New York. 
It would irritate him when English critics would deplore his decline. When he'd played Hamlet, he'd point out to you, more often on Broadway than any other actor in history. London was not as important to him as America and Wales. His Camelot was a huge success. Kenneth Tynan wrote that Burton was peerless. His stage presence has that intangible quality of weight, as distinct from bulk, by which great actors reveal themselves. This is a majestic performance. The longest part he ever played was Wagner in a film not yet seen, which will soon be shown on Channel 4. Let him, our king, let him say, I declare Saxony a free state. Let him rid himself of his sycophants. And if he will not, a word of warning. As Christ says, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Cut it off. Cut it off. Your fatherland is called Germany. Love it above all, and more through action than through words. Germany must have its place in the sun. His private life was to become a public performance of endless notoriety. He was to be a fortunate man in his last marriage. Richard Burton was a boundlessly generous and kind man, much more than a voice or an actor. He always wanted to be a writer, not an actor. If ever there was any cause to do with Wales that needed help, he would always give his time and his money. I used to wonder, not altogether frivolously, if in the next life, he would meet his old pal, Dylan Thomas, whose work he read so beautifully, which is the only cheerful thought I can summon up on this black day for his friends, his family, and his public. In March 1982, Richard Burton came to London to pay tribute to the man he'd first met as a 19-year-old and whose work was to have such influence on his career, Dylan Thomas. A plaque to the Welsh writer was unveiled in Westminster Abbey by his daughter, Aronwy. At that time, Burton gave an extended interview to John Morgan. First, he gave him his impressions of the poet, who became his friend. In a curious kind of way, he seemed to me like a, a marvellous Welsh preacher. Despite, I believe one of his ancestors was a preacher. So, and death shall have no dominion. You know, the way the, 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 when they get the hoil in, in Wales, uh, they repeat a line endlessly because of the beauty of the line. So you are saying, but poi a thou gadavi amla than er bin gilin. And then the noise is so beautiful that they say it again. So they go into the hood. And death shall have no dominion. It's exactly like that. Did you admire his voice very much? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. I thought he had... Uh, it's odd today with all the Welsh people around, with Sir Geraint Evans and Meredith Edwards and Clifford Evans, they all have this kind of tonal quality. It comes through the top of the nose. And we all, I, I suppose everybody from South Wales has this... Uh, funny noise that we don't know how, how it comes. Uh, Geraint says that it's something to do with the vowel sounds in the Welsh language, which doesn't, of course, apply to English. But I think he may have a point there. It's something very curious. Did you like Dylan Thomas? Very much, yes. I was in awe of him, of course, as I'm in awe, indeed, of all uh, poets. When I knew T.S. Eliot and I knew uh, Stephen Spender, I know Stephen Spender, and I knew Winston Orton, and even if they didn't speak, I was like, as to a relatively beside myself when I uh, met them, talked to them, David Jones, all those great. Was this because you wanted to be a writer more than an actor? Uh, well, yes, I think uh, that in a sense, I'm uh, much more a compulsive writer than a compulsive actor, though I suppose we all act, don't we, all the time. Um, and certainly I write all the time. I never stop writing. I very rarely publish. Sometimes I do. And they pay you quite a lot, don't they? Not as much as acting, I suspect. Not Judging from my much. experience, anyway. <laughs> no, not quite as much. But uh, when you talk about your writing, uh, what kind of writing is this? I, mean, well, I remember I, you telling me years ago that you were keeping a diary. Is that still the case? Yes, yes. And I've kept a diary since I was about 12, I think. Uh, it's, it's, 
lots of words, uh, most of it rubbish, I'm afraid. I mean, it takes the form sometimes of a short story, or it may, today, obviously, it will be about you and, and Geraint Evans and Elizabeth Taylor and my family, because they're all in Guernsey today, because one of my nephews is getting married. As I'm not, not, not entirely sure what form it take, but it sort of clears my mind in some odd way. Well, do you record what other people say to you or what other people are doing, or is it a matter of setting down your own reflections? Well, of, the, of, of everything. What you say, I will remember more or less accurately. I might get a word or two wrong. And uh, it's just impossible. I don't know what I'm going to write. These would be very valuable uh, books to publish. Do you propose to publish them? No, no, no. Never? No, no. They're not meant to be read, though I write them as if they're going to be read. Um, they, they still, uh, they're there, and I put them in the bank and forget about them. They give a very fascinating view of uh, the acting profession uh, and other aspects of acting life, perhaps, over the past, what now, over th nearly 40 years. Yes. Is your view of the profession different, do you think, when you look at them from the view you had when you started writing them about being an actor? Well, I don't quite know what it is to be an actor, uh, to be a successful actor anyway, and a leading man or whatever you want to call me. I'm not entirely sure what acting is about. You see, if, if 20 people walk onto the stage at this moment in this theater, the Duke of York's, right, you are going to look at one of them. 19 will be forgotten. You're going to look at one of those blokes or one of those girls. Now, what attracts your imagination, your eye, or whatever it is, we shall never know. What they have is that curious quality, that overused word, they have charisma, something odd about them. They may be short, tall, fat, thin, old, young, petty, puny, idiotic, whatever. You're going to look at that one person. Nobody knows why. Claire Bloom has just written uh, of a performance which you were in with her in the, I think it was the late 40s, uh, with John Gielgud, The Ladies on for Burning, which I remember seeing here in London. And she says that she was very uh, put out that acting, your acting, was looked so easy and it was so difficult for her. Oh, yes, yes. She does, yes. Well, I wanted to feel, no, she's right. Did you find it easy? Always. Always. I never found it difficult at all. And indeed, as a matter of fact, a great many people say about uh, my particular brand of acting that it's effortless. It seems effortless. Of course, there's a great deal going on inside. Uh, Claire, would, uh, it would seem to me, was a natural actress. I'm surprised that she found it difficult. Um, I don't know why I had to do in that play, actually. All I had to do was scrub the stage. Scrub the stage with no bucket and no water and no cloth and no... Uh, and Jim Clutin, huh? And, uh, no, I didn't I I've never found it difficult. Do you find uh, remembering lines easy? Oh, yes. Uh, so far. Uh, come today, I suppose, I won't be able to remember anything. I'm playing, at the moment, I'm playing one of the longest parts I should think ever written by anybody. Uh, it's longer than, you know, the, the longest part, apparently, in the world is Iago, who is six, six words longer than Hamlet. Well, I've played both, and I've played Othello. All three of them stuck together is not as long as the part I'm playing now. I never stop talking. But because you don't have to learn the lines uh, of, as you would with Iago or Hamlet in the same way, do you? And well, retain them, you know, night after night in your mind. Oh, you? sure, I have to learn them exactly as if I'm playing Hamlet. Mm. Mm. When you played these uh, classic roles, uh, did you spend a lot of time thinking about their meaning? Or, or did even the understanding of them come easily to you? Well, the understanding, I think, changes as you get older. Uh, well, I first played Hamlet when I was, for instance, when I was about uh, 27, something like that. And the next time I played it was 10 years later. And all the lines had changed their meaning by the time I played it the second time. And uh, words of such impossible beauty as to take your breath away. I mean, for instance, when Hamlet says, I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise. And indeed, it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, look you, this brave or hanging ferment, this majestical roof fretted with gold and fire, why, it seems no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How infinite, in fact, in form, in moving, how 
express in amber, in action, how like an angel in movement, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Now those words change as you get older. You understand them in a different way. They take on a different meaning. They're so massive, of course, so powerful that it takes one's breath away. The long gone atavistic hairs on the back of your spine rise with such language when it's invented for you and you're allowed the privilege to speak it. But it changes. When you think of a, a role like Lear, you haven't played Lear, have you? No. No. Would you like to? I'm going to. You are? I have to. It's part of the bond, part of the fellowship. Yeah, I have to play it. Well, you, which bond is that? Which fellowship? A no, bond. Uh, uh, I became an actor by accident. And having become an actor and was almost immediately successful, I decided that I had a bond with uh, with other actors, and that I had to play. Or a bond great. with Shakespeare. Or a bond with Shakespeare, or a bond with the idea of, of, uh, of I don't know, human intelligence. I have a bond with Laurence Olivier, I have a bond with John Gill, all three of them, uh, Ralph Richardson, I've worked with all three of them recently. I worked with most of the great actors of the world, uh, certainly in the English-speaking world. And there's a curious kind of thing. It's not competition. It's, it's a kind of attempt at excellence. Very difficult to understand, I think, for the lay person. Uh, but, of course, I have to play Leah. They won't play, and I have to go. Will you play it in Britain, do you think? No, I don't think so, because you will charge me those awful taxes. So I think it'll probably be in uh, the United States and maybe Australia or something like that. I don't know, hopefully I can bring it here, if it's any good. Well, as you say, quite rightly, you were very successful, very young. Do you think it was at all harmful to you being quite so successful? Well, I'm not sure, John. Um, it may have been a bad idea. On the other hand, I do remember people who didn't make a success of uh, acting or writing or whatever it is until their middle age, and they were very embittered people. Uh, I think it's possibly a good idea to be successful when you are, because you learn to live with success. Uh, it doesn't come late, so you don't know how to handle it, and you become frightened and nervous and all that. Um, Do you think you've lived with success successfully? That I don't know. I don't know. Uh, certainly I think so, because I'm still alive. And I, what, still alive at 56? Well, I'm still alive. Do you know, I remember, uh, perhaps you don't, I hope you don't, uh, writing a profile of you about 20 years ago in the New States, where I think I remarked saying that the Welsh like their heroes to die young, Dylan Thomas being the case in point, and that the Welsh, for some melancholy or self-destructive reason, have no talent at all for being middle-aged. I wasn't suggesting that you... I, I can't really think what I was suggesting. But do you think there's any truth in that? Middle age is a very difficult period for uh, the I melancholy Celt. Is, it's a very difficult period for anybody, I should think. Uh, I would say that between the age of, shall we say, 40 and 52 or something like that, one always, male or female, Welsh or un-Welsh, you go through a bad time. The Welsh have a particular kind of, certainly my particular brand of Welsh people, have a, a penchant for uh, melancholy. I think that we are capable of ecstasy. Uh, we're also capable of the opposite. You know, every, as Newton said, every action has uh, an equal and positive reaction. And in my case, uh, I can go as I'm, I, for, for, for instance, at the moment, I'm perfectly happy, perfectly happy, more than content, happy. But who knows, next Wednesday, I may descend into some abysmal gloom that nobody can get me out of. Take me three or four days. I know it's coming. I warn my friends, I warn everybody, and uh, we get out of it. Now, whether the Welsh and the Irish and the Scots and the English, you know, are very melancholy people, too. I mean, they're much more imaginative than people think. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to say about the idea of moods and their passions and their sweetness and their brilliance and their uh, optimists. I, I can't quite explain it. Certainly you're a Welshman, I'm a Welshman. We both sort of understand that impossible gloom that we get into sometimes. Is, uh, do you think there's a, an element of self-destruction involved as well there? I, I mean, some so. people have said, as you know about you, that you have got a self-destructive streak. Well, many Welsh oh, people Oh, yeah, they have. never stop telling me that I'm Faustus, that I've sold my soul to the devil and all that. And doubtless I have, and I don't know who the devil is. But, um, yes, I suppose. You see, we're all self-destructive, aren't we? We're all reaching. I mean, even your growing pains are reaching to the grave. 
We were all going to go down there, six feet down, right? We were all first cousins to the shovel. And uh, it's there, and I suppose one seeks for it in a kind of way. One seeks for that impossible oblivion, the idea of never having to wake up again and sleep forever and forever and forever is, of course, a very amusing, bemusing idea. Yes, some people have said of the couch that they cry when they come out of the womb because they're so fed up that it's happened to them. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> but uh, the amount of your life that has been written about in public, you, you are, I mean, let's consider this very weak not today. Uh, has that distressed you? Well, uh, about 25 years ago, uh, as a matter of fact, around about when we first met, would be about 25 mm -hmm. years, isn't it? I decided not to read my, about myself. I, I don't make a fetish of it. I mean, if my name happens to be in the papers, like today, I'm on the front cover of something or other, and I read the impossible lines. Uh, so I don't make a fetish about it, but generally, for the most part, I try not to read about myself because it's all distorted. I don't know who it is. I, it's as if I'm reading about a foreign person, some of an alien creature that I don't know anything about. So I try to avoid reading about myself. Uh, which perhaps keep, keeps me on a relatively even keel. But I'm not entirely sure of that, too. Fame is a very, or notoriety, or infamy, in my case, perhaps, is a very delicate thing to handle. Very delicate. You have to be terribly careful. Did you ever feel at any time that, that you were responsible that you sought the fame, or did you regard it as something that was the inevitable consequence of your profession? Well, uh, it seems that uh, by some mischance or happy chance, I don't know what. I have a kind of uh, genius for publicity. I don't know what it is. I remember when I first came to London, and uh, my first day of rehearsal with em in Emily Winnie's play, The Druid's Rest, I went on a tube from uh, Hampstead to, to uh, I've forgotten the name of the place now, on the outside of the tube. I was on the front page of the papers the first day I arrived in London. I was only 16 and a half. What do you mean on the outside of the tube? Well, I, you see, I, I caught the wrong train, and I was getting out, and I grabbed my coat and pulled me back. So I was on the other side, and we went through, right through the tunnel. And the press were there. Absolutely sorry. I mean, they, they knew that I was, somebody was on the outside of the tunnel, that's all. It was just a little bit in the papers. But it is a kind of uh, idiocy. Have you done many things that you particularly regret? Many. I'm not going to tell you what. <laughs> How much do you think your Welsh background contributed to your abilities? Oh, uh, enormously. I mean, I am Welsh. Uh, I carry the valleys uh, and the sea towns wherever I go. They're on my shoulders. I can't evade them. I can't escape them. They are, they are my people. There is something curious. We, all, we both come from the same part of the world. There's something curious about them, like today, being around so many Welsh people. It's, it's really, really like being at home. It's a great, uh, ferocious nostalgia for my own country. No, nothing like it. I mean, I'm very fond of the English. I like the French. I speak French. I speak Italian. I speak American. Uh, but nobody quite like my own. I'm absolutely at home with them. And do you think it's given your acting a particular quality? There's an element in your performance which you could ascribe to your background. Yeah, well, your I voice obviously is, is uh, one of your, you would regard yourself as one of your greatest assets. Well, that clearly is, is, has its origins there. Isn't it? Oh, yes, there. I think it's invested with small coal and rain and, or something. I mean, the voice is uh, the voice of my people. I'm, uh, in a sense, wherever I go, I'm the authentic uh, dark voice of my tortured of the valley. Uh, I'm it, and it is me. I can't help it. Well, Richard Burton was a man who captivated people all over the world, but he did have a special place in his heart for Wales. In a moment, we shall meet family and friends who remember him fondly, and in the studio, Robert Hardy, Winfred Vaughan Thomas, John Morgan, and Alexander Walker will try and shed light on this gifted and complex man. Hunt, this time in 1976 with his third wife, the former Susie Hunt neighbors and fellow villagers lined up to share a word and a kiss. He was genuinely pleased to meet them and they him. Uh, 
yes. Yes, well, they always keep a welcome in these particular hillsides and these particular vales, you know, at least for me. Today, as one of those who had welcomed him put it, a spell of gloom had been cast over the village. They found it hard to believe he'd gone. High above the house where he'd been born, I spoke to four of his surviving seven brothers and sisters. When he returned to Wales when he was famous, did he act the superstar, the big star with his family? No, no never, no, never. No, never. Um, very humble and down to earth. Very humble and down to earth, yes. He could speak in the Welsh tongue. He could speak in the language that we are accustomed to. He could speak with a Cockney accent, an American accent. He could act every part. He had this gift. So he never forgot his roots? Never, never. No, no. So there was a time when Richard did suffer some quite bad publicity. Did this upset the family? Well, it's bound to upset the family at times, you know, when, uh, <laughs> when it, you, you're talking about my flesh and blood, you know, when uh, some critic says that uh, he was up to this trick or that trick or wasn't performing so well as he should do or something like that, it's bound to hurt you. But of course, you must realize this, it doesn't matter how bad he acted or how good he acted, we all loved him. That's the important thing. And you see, he's achieved something that thousands throughout the world would like to achieve. And he was yes. never ashamed of his fairly no. humble background. No, no, never, mm. never. I think if he's remembered by mm. his voice, I think, in Shakespeare and in the mm. plays he's done on stage, I think, with yes. most people. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Of course, you must realize that we are seven brothers. And we were uh, seven brothers. We were seven brothers. And the eldest brother worked in the pit. Ivor, my brother, worked in the pit. David Arthur, my brother, yeah, worked in the pit. I worked in the pit. Will, my brother in Scotland, worked in the pit. And the only two brothers that never worked in the pit was Richard and Graham. And just imagine how proud we were as miners to think that we had a brother that became world famous. I think that is something to cherish. Can I ask, how did you hear the news? Well, I was in chapel when my brother came. He had the name from Los Angeles, there then. And, um... <coughs> He told us there, because we just come from the service. Yes. And of course, well, we've been standing since all of us, because he was such a wonderful brother. Robert Harder, your association with Richard Burton goes back a long way. When did you first meet? We met at Oxford when we were both um, RAF cadets and doing half and half <coughs> training and, and um, student. Uh, work at the university and that was I think I'm right in saying 41 years ago it's a long friendship. Is Richard a good student? Pretty unpredictable I would say. Uh, a student with his dash and inventiveness intelligence and talent must be a good student in some senses I have no doubt that some people find it very difficult. Just lingering with the RAF for a moment, uh, Robert, how did he take to discipline? Uh, he put it in a corner of the room and punched it to pieces. Uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't a good man to discipline. There was one time la later on when uh, we were all rather hanging about. He was up at an airfield in, uh, in Norfolk, and so was I briefly. But he was there a long time, and he was kept there because, of course, he was on the rugby team. And they rarely lived off the land. They, uh, they, he became known as the Squire of Docking, which was the, the next door village, which he practically took over. Were you aware from a very early stage that he did have a unique acting talent? Oh, yes, without the slightest question. Not only that uh, he had a, a unique acting talent, but that he was a unique creature. He had a greatness which he could have turned in any direction, and I remember vividly after being with him for a few days on some airfield or other during which time i think we sorted out exactly how to produce at least six plays of shakespeare's uh which had always been wrong hitherto in our view uh i wrote him a letter with that i'm self-conscious sort of uh, straightforwardness that one has in one's youth uh telling him that he was a great man and he'd better better abide by it and watch it and use it it's been suggested, you know, because of that unique talent, that perhaps success came too easily. Do you feel that? Uh, it doesn't seem to me so, no. I think that uh, he went through a very 
typical sort of uh, run-up to the great part. Uh, I've been interested and a little bit disappointed reading the obituaries this morning that um, the greatest thing that I remember him doing, which was Prince Hal and Henry V Stratford in 1951, has not received much mention. It was an absolutely towering performance, and the notices of the period give some indication of the kind of power that he built and of the strength of his personality and uh, the brightness of his genius on the stage at that time. Also, people are taking the opportunity, I think, of rather declaring that his was a wasted life. In one of the papers, it was a, the headline was a talent carelessly thrown away, and uh, I'm afraid I don't go along with that. We do, I think, what, uh, what we wish to do in life, and he sought all sorts of other things than simply fulfilling his acting promise. I think that... Uh, we would do better to remember with gratitude the strength of the best things he did. And uh, now that it is too late to alter the shape of his life, to uh, rejoice in the fact that he lived at all, I find the prospect of uh, a world without rich, very bleak. Robert, looking more closely at the man behind the acting mask, he also seemed to have a vul vulnerability and a melancholy about him. Now, were those traits that were manifest in his early years? Yes, I think they were. I think they, they fed the riot for which he was famous. He, he tried to take off the melancholy, which is uh, partly a Celtic attribute, isn't it? Uh, by um, being a pretty wild boy. And I think that that lasted uh, in the sense that most actors, and he was by nature very, very much an actor, so that any alternative he might have pursued, like uh, being a great politician or whatever, I think, uh, had fallen at an early fence in the race. How do you feel the acting fraternity will remember Richard Burton? I hope with the astonishment with which, in honesty, it greeted him as each new uh, conquest, in the days of his conquest, was, was coming at them. I hope they will resist the temptation to say, oh, well, after all, he was, he was not as great as we thought at some times. I'm perfectly sure that not only the acting profession, but uh, anybody who ever came across him will remember him with the most profound affection. Alexander Walker, many English stage-trained actors seem to find it difficult to make the transition into movies, but it seems to me that Richard Burton plunged in. Is that your impression of his film career? Yes, he certainly plunged in, and Hollywood pushed him in. I must say, they pushed him in at the deep end, and he looked rather as if he was struggling at first, because he tended to project himself rather too much for the camera. In fact, it wasn't until he married Elizabeth Taylor, and she told him some of the finer points of film acting, which depended upon reacting, that he vastly improved as a player. Over the years, you've obviously had many chances to, to view that talent. How would you describe his film acting ability overall? Because he made quite a number of films. Uh, a man of immense power. He was very difficult to fit into a film. You had to have actors of considerable powerhouse caliber with Richard Burton in order to, uh, uh, to, gi to give him that, that sense of support without allowing him to dominate it. He tended in films, as he did in off-screen, to turn acting talent into worldly power. Uh, a powerhouse figure. Uh, he used his voice uh, to project himself. And I think it will be interesting to see his last film, which is 1984, in which he was specifically cast because he could dominate John Hurt, the Winston Smith character. Richard Burton played the part of an interrogator. Uh, he wasn't an actor of, of great range, which is rather surprising. He excelled at playing princes and, and courtly figures, uh, as in the film uh, Beckett, uh, which, as he himself commented, was rather odd for a, a humble Welsh boy. Uh, but he was an actor whom you could, you could predict how he was going to play the part, unlike Marlon Brando. And I think perhaps he was a stage actor who was never entirely comfortable as a film star. Richard Vaughan Thomas, when did you first meet Richard Burton? Well, actually, I met him before the war. Uh,
Richard Burton, a tribute, replaced the published programme, which will be shown at a later date. Continuing the tribute tomorrow is a special presentation on Channel 4 of the Dylan Thomas radio play Under Milkwood, adapted for film and starring Richard Burton in this most Welsh of all dramas. He co-stars with Elizabeth Taylor, Glynis Jones and Peter O'Toole. Channel 4 will present Under Milkwood in a further tribute to Richard Burton starting at 9 o'clock tomorrow evening.